Welcome back everybody. Today we're going to talk about plants in a little more detail. So this time we're actually looking at the entire plant, looking at the types of tissues a plant have, has, and the actual cell types a plant is consisting of. And finally, the last part deals with the actual organs a plant possesses. As you may not be aware, um, if you look at an entire organism, an organism made up a group of a group of organ systems, such as your nervous system, your respiratory system, your cardiovascular system, your urinary system. Each organ system is made up of individual organs, like the kidney, the liver, the heart. And then each individual organ is made up of tissues, which are a cell types, or a type, all cells that have a similar type and do a similar function and then each tissue is made up of the individual cells. In a plant, there's three main basic cell types that you need to know the, that make up plant tissues and make up the entire plant. The first type are known as parenchyma cells, which are the most common cell type in a plant. These are gonna do most of the actual function of a plant, so they're there for storage of starch, oils, and water. They're there for healing of wounds. They're there for metabolism, so they're the real workhorse part of a plant. This is the type of cell you think about when you think of drawing a plant cell like you did. And they have very thin, flexible walls. The second type is known as colenchyma. These are like collagen, so they're structural support. So they're gonna provide support for this growing plant. They're gonna be strong and very flexible. They have a thicker cell wall than the parenchyma cells. An example of these are celery strings, so that they're flexible and bendy, but they still have some actual support. And then the final type are known as sclerenchyma cells. These are the strongest cell types. They actually have a second cell wall that is hardened, so they're extremely strong and they're actually dead. And when they reach maturity, the cell dies and you're just left, basically left with the husk, um, which is like the outside of the bark. So these are really there just for support. So par parenchyma are there for actually doing most of the functions for the plant. Colenchyma are there for a little bit of support and structure, and then sclerenchyma cells are providing that real rigid structure on the outside. These three plant tissue, or sorry, these three cell types form four plant tissues in a plant. The first type or first tissue type is known as dermal tissue. This is the tissue that's found on the outside of a plant. You have dermal tissue also, we call it skin, just like you go to the dermatologist when you have a skin issue. Um, plants have that external coating, which is just like how we have skin, they have it for protection. So dermal tissue is just for the outside of the plant to provide that skin of the plant. The second tissue type is known as ground tissue. This is the workhorse tissue type. It's found inside of a plant to provide support. It's once again going to store materials, and it's made of that very common parenchyma cell type that's going to do most of the work for the actual plant. The third type is known as vascular tissue. You have a cardiovascular system, so which is used for transport materials around your body, the blood and the blood vessels in the heart. That's your cardiovascular system to transport nutrients and other products around your body. Plants also need an ability to get nutrients around itself, um, either whether it's from their roots up to the stems to leaves or vice versa. So they have a vascular system also made of vascular tissue, which is there for transport. There's actually two types of vascular tissue that you need to know, and we'll go into more detail. You have the xylem, which provides a basically a tube to allow water to move from the roots up the stems and out the leaves, any other dissolved nutrients in that water. And then you have the phloem, which is there to move the products of photosynthesis, which means that it's there mostly to move glucose. So it's there to move the sugar around the plant to get it to where the cells need it in the plant. And then the final tissue type is known as meristematic tissue. Meristematic tissue is actively dividing tissue. So the first three are no longer dividing, they're at maturity, so they're not going to make more cells. If the plant needs to make more cells, we call that meristematic tissue, which is going to be there obviously for wound healing or going to be there to in the root tips to extend out and search, ex elongate those roots to actually go out and find water. And it's also in the what we call the cambia, which is the part of the stem that's actually going to extend outward and widen and strengthen. So if you think of the rings of a tree, that's what we call the cambia or cambium singularly and that is made of meristematic tissue that's going to help widen the stem. So you have meristematic tissue in the root tips to elongate those roots and search out for water, and then you have meristematic tissue in the cambia, which is there to extend the, the width of the stem for support. 
Looking at the vascular tissue in a little more detail, the question is how does water actually move in a plant? And we already briefly touched on this when we did properties of water back in August, but the theory is known as cohesion tension theory. This is how water actually moves in a plant. So the idea is that you're using adhesion and cohesion to move the water inside the xylem and eventually out the plant. So you have, remember, adhesion is when water sticks to other substances, and then cohesion is when water is sticking to itself. And using these two properties of water, the plant can use those to actually suck up water from the roots, have them travel through the stem, and eventually leave the leaves and get water to where it needs to go. And the tube that actually travels through is known as the xylem. So the xylem is going to tra transport the water up the from the roots up the stem and eventually out the leaves. And what's interesting is the xylem is actually made of dead cells. So literally you think of the xylem as an empty tube inside the plant that only allows water to actually travel through it. How does water actually get to the top? It creates a suction just like how you get water from the bottom of your drink. So you have the water at the very bottom of the roots. So the water is going to get absorbed in the roots and the, it's going to stick to the inside of the xylem through adhesion and cohesion. It's going to travel up the xylem and eventually it's going to leave the root, sorry, leave the leaves through what we call transpiration. So transpiration is the loss of water through leaves. Basically, we talked about it before, but it's basically evaporation through the openings in the leaves, which we call stomata. So this creates a sucking action, just like if you were to suck on a straw to get water. So the transpiration, the evaporation through the leaves creates a pressure difference, and it's going to carry that water from the roots up the stem through the xylem and eventually out the leaves. And this is a one-way path. So the water can only travel from down to up in the xylem. You can never have water going downwards. That's why when you water your plants, you don't water the leaves because the leaves won't, can't absorb water. You need to water the roots and the water can only travel one direction inside of the xylem. The second type of vascular tissue is known as the phloem. The phloem, as we said, is there to transport sugar. The model that describes how, why that sugar is moving or how that sugar is moving is known as the pressure flow model. And unlike in the xylem, which was a passive process for the plant, so naturally the plant can just open their stomata, open those little openings, transpiration can happen, that water can move naturally, the plant doesn't have to do anything. In movement of sugar in the phloem, the plant actually has to use active transport to move those materials around. So the phloem is there for transporting sugar from where it needs to go, basically. And unlike the xylem, I won't test you on this, but the phloem is actually made of live cells. So the xylem is basically a dead tube because this phloem does require um, active transport to actually move materials around, you do need live cells for this. And the way that water actually, sorry, not water, the way that sugar actually moves in the plant is that we say that it moves from source to sink. So in the xylem, water can only move in one direction up. However, in the phloem, wa the, not water, the glucose can move in any direction it needs to. So it's always going to move from an area where there's lots of sugar, source, to an area where there's a not a lot of sugar, sink. So it's from source to sink. So if the plant is undergoing photosynthesis, it's creating a lot of sugar in the leaves, and obviously the roots are not creating sugar, so there's less sugar in the roots or in the fruit. So the sugar is going to move from source down to the sink in the roots or the um, fruit. So it's going to move downward. However, if the photosynth if photosynthesis is not happening, let's say it's the winter time and the plant is dormant. However, you still need to keep the top part of the plant alive. In that case, the roots are going to store the sugar and the sugar is going to go in the opposite direction. It's going to go from where there's a lot of sugar in the roots to up the stem to support those cells Bef while the plant cannot be doing photosynthesis because either the leaves are dead or it's nighttime. So sugar always moves from source to sink and it's always moving in the phloem. Think of the phloem as like the flow of sugar. The last part of this video deals with the three plant organs. There's actually four, but we're just dealing with three of them right now. And you actually already know the three plant organs that we're dealing with. They're called roots, stems, and leaves. Who knew plants had actual organs, but that's what we call them. And you need to know the functions for each of these. 
And they're pretty basic functions and they're stuff that you probably already know if you have any clue about plants. So the functions of roots are they are there for support, obviously. They're anchoring that plant to make sure they don't, get, they don't fall over or blow away. They're obviously there for absorption, so they're absorbing nutrients or water, anything from the soil. And individually, if you look at this picture, you see all these little hairs that come off, and those are there to increase absorption. So the more surface area that you have sticking out, the more water and the more nutrients this plant can absorb, and the more nutrients it has to undergo whatever the plant needs to undergo. The stem is the next organ that we're dealing with. The stem also has many functions. Once again, it's there for support. It's literally that connection between the roots of the bottom and the leaves at the top. It's going to find, be where you find most of your vascular system. So this is where you're going to find the phloem and the xylem most of the time um, because that stem is that connection point between the roots and the leaves and the flowers, if they have flowers. It's going to store some water. It's going to grow underground for storage. And it's also going to help form new plants like in strawberries where they literally can um, break off and have these little saplings that come off of the main plant by just extending out the stem. And finally, the last organ that we're dealing with is the leaf. The leaf is there for photosynthesis, so it's the main site of photosynthesis. So I really want you to think of a leaf as a little solar pad. That's what it's there for, a solar panel. That's what it's there for. It's there to absorb light and for photosynthesis to happen inside of it. As you already know, CO2 is needed for photosynthesis. So the question is, how does plants get CO2 inside of it? What it actually does is, it ha underneath, on the underside of the leaves, it has these little openings, which we call stomata, or if there's one of them, it's called a stoma. So stomata is plural, stoma is singular. These little openings allow for gas exchange. They're little, literally little openings that allow gases to enter or leave the leaf as needed. So the plant can control these stoma or these stomata through these two cells on either side called guard cells. And they're literally going to guard the openings. That's why they're called guard cells. So the plant can control these guard cells and control whether the stomata are open or closed. If the plant needs CO2 for photosynthesis, the or it needs to allow for water to evaporate, which allows that transpiration action, that allows that water to move from the roots, the guard cells will be open. Gases can exchange, water can leave, unfortunately, which is not always a good thing, and so transpiration can occur. If it's, let's say, nighttime and the plant doesn't need to undergo photosynthesis, since there's no light, the guard cells can close the stomata, which is obviously going to prevent water loss, because if you leave your openings open all the time, water is going to leave, and eventually the plant's going to dehydrate and die. So the plant does need to regulate whether these stomata are open and closed to make sure that you get the gases you need in and out but you don't lose too much water during that time. So stomata are extremely important for function, and they're only found on the underside of the plant, as you can see down here. So that's it for this video. There is a fourth plant organ known as the flower, which deals with reproduction. That will deal with in a later point in time, since not all plants actually have flowers. But this is pretty much the main details that you need to understand about plants for the purposes of this part of the course.